down the road in that big bus we traveled in, and we had that bag phone. Everybody thought, man, we must be loaded because we had a phone in our, in our RV. Today, everybody's got a phone in their pocket. But we got a phone call from this pastor, and he said, You're, you need to hear this testimony of this young lady. And we said, well, praise God, what's going on? Uh, pastor Robinson was his name. And uh, we said, what's going on? Well, unbeknown to Suzanne and I, they lived in a house that was a very poor, shoddy house. And it had gotten cold in the Ozarks, and they burned wood. And so they had a wood stove. And all, every morning, the kids would get up out of bed, and they'd huddle around the wood stove. And it was cold. But this young girl had been driving down the road every day, and there was Sorry, a trailer place that sold mobile on. homes. And there was one that had a for sale sign on. She'd stop and look at it, and she said, that's my new home. Pastor's been talking about decreeing a thing. Now, I'm, I'm just going to preach to you about two minutes here, so don't look at me like a calf looking at a new gate. She said, that's my new home. And every day she'd drive by, that's my new home. That's my new home. That's my new home. And we had been there in revival about this time of year, and it was in the dead of winter when we got the phone call. So a couple months had went by. But what had happened was a lady had stopped at her house and knocked at her house and said, hello, my name is, I don't live here in Missouri anymore. I live way off. But she said, I grew up as a girl in this house. And she said, I was back here in the Ozarks of Missouri, and I just wanted to see where I grew up. And she said, I was even amazed that the house was here because it was an old house when I lived here. And she came in, and she saw all the kids huddled around the wood stove because it was the middle of winter. Anybody here ever been around a wood stove? Oh, we got a few folks that did grow up in Florida. And, and she saw the kids, and she said, how do you live in this place? It was an old house when I lived here. And the young girl said, well, we're just trusting God. And we're believing God. And, and, and uh, you know, we, we know that God's going to give us something better. And she said, well, that all may be well and good. And I don't know about that. But she said, I do know this. I passed. Oh, I got to tell you one more thing. I almost left out the best part. She drove by this trailer place and sold this trailer and said, so, for sale, for sale. Had a big banner on it. And one day she drove by and it said, sold. And she said, God, they can't sell that because that's my house. And for about four days, she drove by it and it said, sold, sold. And finally, she went back by and the sold sign was gone and said, for sale. Somebody must have bought it and backed out. But this lady said, I don't know about all this, whatever you're saying, but I do know this. This house is not fit to live in. And she said, you've got four kids I see here. And I just passed a trailer place down the road that has a big double wide that says for sale. And I'm going to buy it for you. And pastor called us said we dedicated the house we gave it back to Jesus this lady has it because she said that's mine can I tell you what faith works faith works I just want to reaffirm what pastor's been teaching us faith works and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation that word salvation soteria is a Greek word which means your healing it means your financial prosperity, your well-being, your joy, everything that affects you, not just pie in the sky when you die, but it's everything that affects you. And so we speak life. We speak health. We speak that we are blessed this morning. This morning, as you prepare to give, let me remind you, sow seed. Use your, use your giving as an act of faith and say, I am believing God. And I said this last week, and I want to reiterate it because I'm believing God for the end of the year. We started the end of the, the beginning of this year with several credit card debts. I don't remember how much we had in credit card debt. We had some debt. Too much, my wife says. Way too much. And uh, so my wife, when we was, the pastor said, sow seed and mark it down, I, I wrote on mine, bigger boat. She wrote on hers, out of debt completely. And hers was more important than mine. So we scratched the bigger boat idea, and we said, okay, we're going to go with out of debt. We're just about there, right? Bless the Lord. Whenever we, she pays that last credit card, I'm going to have her get up and receive the offering and, and, and tell you what God has done. When you sow seed, it works. So this morning we ask you to sow seed. Believe God. Believe the word of the Lord, and let's put our faith into action. Ushers, if you'll come this morning. Father, thank you for the opportunity to give. We do not give to a man, to a ministry, to an organization, to a church. We give to you. And so, Lord, as we sow seed this morning, 
as we sow in faith we're reminded this is not a debt we owe this is a seed we sow uh, we thank you for your word said you rebuke the devourer for our sakes in Jesus name amen God bless you these ushers will come by they will wait upon you and as you sow your seed just remember God has promised to bless you God has amen. promised to bless you come on give the Lord some praise this morning how many are blessable this morning you know, if we come to church and all we do is sit and listen, well, that's better than not coming at all. But, you know, driving through a, a, a garage doesn't make you a car. You know, uh, you, 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 you got you to gotta take it in. Just because a person's in church doesn't make them a Christian. You've got to receive. You have got to receive. So open your hearts. We have a wonderful pastor. Pastor, we've been praying for you. We're glad you're here. We love you. Thank you. you. Would you give the Lord a great big hand for our pastor, Pastor Raymond Duvall, this morning? Thank you, Brother Warren. Good morning again, everybody. I'm excited to get to, get to share the Word of God in just a few minutes, but I just wanted to tell you how precious you are to God. To know that if you were the only person who ever needed salvation or ever needed healing or needed deliverance, you know that God loves you so much, He would have sent Jesus just for you. But the fact of the matter is, is that he did send Jesus just for you and for me and for everyone who will receive him. And his plan for you, I've read it in the, in the scripture, it says that they are good plans. Plans not to harm you, but plans to prosper you and give you hope and a future. So that means a, a hopeful and prosperous future is ahead of you. And that is in God's plans. How many, how many people know, however, that uh, sometimes people don't want to get with God's plans? You know, and over in Proverbs it says, this is a, a more literal translation, it says people mess up their lives and then they blame God. You know what that kind of plan is? That's the kind of plan you come to God and say, God, this is what I'm going to do. Bless it. Instead of going to God first and say, God, what do you want me to do? What have you got for me? Well, God's got an amazing, totally wonderful plan for you and it is so exciting that the scripture would say that the things that God desires to do in you and through you are greater than anything that you can ask or think or imagine. And so over these past several weeks, we've, oh, I've got to do something. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Before I get into the word, there's something I've got to do. We need to spend some time praying for our nation. There's a very important election, as you know, and frankly, all elections are important. But this election coming up, if you've not already voted, you can, uh, I, you may be able to still early vote today. I don't, if, you know, the signs are still up. So those of you on the beach, if you haven't voted, you want to early vote, then you can go to the uh, Senior Center on Alf Coleman Road and you can vote there. But of course, you can vote in person as a whole lot of folks do on Tuesday. So we're going to be praying and thanking God because this is what I want to come out of this election I want godly people in office. I want people who are godly, not people who just say that they're Christians or say that they're believers, because as Warren was mentioned about driving through a garage, it's like, uh, you know, I used to say, if, you know, if, if you're born in the backseat of a Greyhound bus, does that make you a Greyhound or Greg Allman or whatever? But, you know, it, it's, or does it make you a rambling man or woman? But absolutely not. See, to be a Christian, at least by through the Bible terminology of Christian, is someone who is born again and has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we have a personal relationship with Jesus, it's not something that uh, we do by lip service. Now, how many of you think that, I mean, you're married, you just got married, and you told your husband or your wife that, that you wanted to go away for a month, and it didn't matter whatever that they wanted, that they were just going to have to deal with it. And then months pass, and, and a year passes, and they still haven't come back. And, and, and the, the spouse calls and says, yeah, I know I've been gone a while, but I'm still married to you. Uh, you know, we're still a couple. And they don't hear for another five years. But they call on the phone and say, yeah, we're still a couple. And then after five years or so, they show up together to meet each other at Easter, at the Easter service. And he said, well, we're here today. We're here at this service. We're together. We're still married, and we're still a couple. 
Well, you see, that might be true legally, but let me tell you, that's the way that most Christians, or I shouldn't say most, but many Christians treat God. We enter into a relationship with Jesus, but then we never come to church. Uh, we, say, we say that we love the baby Jesus, but we live entirely different lifestyles than what the Scripture says we should lead. So it's so important then that if we're Christians, then we should really be Christians. And I, I really desire for our government to have officials, those who are Christians and who are saying they are Christians, that they actually are Christians and they live according to the Scripture. Now that doesn't require, incidentally, that they be perfect. Because if, if holding political office, if the first requirement was perfection, nobody would ever make it. Matter of fact, we wouldn't even make it in life. But it's so important for us to know that when we pray and ask God to raise up godly men and women to positions of office and to cause his favor to shine upon those who have the closest godly agenda, and I'm not going to talk any about voting anymore after today. And of course, last Sunday I did the time after service. If you have any questions about those things, you can ask me later on after service closes. But we need to pray. Because things are on an edge right now in our country. And we don't need to continue this way. We need a change, and change is coming. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we give you all the glory and all the honor. We thank you this morning that you said in your word that we're to pray first for kings and all that are in authority over us. That's the first prayer we should make. So, Lord, we pray for President Donald Trump. We ask that you would give him wisdom, that you would grant him knowledge, Lord. We thank you for surrounding him with godly counselors, those who will speak the truth of God's word. We thank you that you've given your angels charge concerning him and his family, concerning Vice President Pence and their family, and everyone who works in the White House, Lord God. I thank you for raising up a witness for Jesus in every office, every executive office on the federal level and the state level and the local level in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that as we go to the polls on Tuesday, that you would give us ears to hear what you have to say. Father, to tune out the commercials and the claims, but listen to the Spirit of God. And so, Father, we thank you that as we do that, that you will guide us and direct us as exactly who to vote for. And, Father, I come against the spirit of division and strife and murder that's been loosed in this nation. And, Satan, I demand that you bow your knee in Jesus' name. I come against you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth and with the blood of Jesus. And, Father, I thank you for joining us together as a nation, even as one nation under God, submitted to you, Lord, for your purpose for revival in the United States of America. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> amen. Praise God. Well, we have been spending some time over the past several months on a series of messages called Thy Kingdom Come. And I'm going to continue in that this morning with the subtitle, Resources in the Kingdom. So we've been looking at a specific part of the Lord's Prayer, as it's called by Protestants, or the Our Father Prayer, as called and defined by Catholics. But Jesus taught this prayer as a model to his disciples in response to the request, Lord, teach us to pray. And that's in Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. So Jesus prayed. And let me read Matthew's rendition of this prayer. He says, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your heavenly Father knoweth what things you have need of before ye ask him. God knows all your needs. That's why I never go to God about my needs. Now I do go to God about my wants, because there's things that I want. And I go to God about that, but my needs are met according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he says this, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So we know then the theme here, Jesus said it. He wants things that are in heaven to be in earth. 
And did you know that Jesus spent, a, spent a much more time talking about bringing heaven to earth than he did going to heaven? I mean, that was, the, that was the focus of what he was doing when he was here. He came to preach the gospel, the good news, and that is because we need the kingdom of God manifest in our lives right now. And I'll tell you something, you can have the kingdom of God manifest in your life even if nobody else wants to come along with you. You know, I've had people tell me, you know, well, I just don't, I believe that God has done this and I believe that God has done that and that God afflicts people and he makes them sick and he sends disasters. And, and I said, okay, you can believe that and you can take all, all, any, any that are headed your way. Because if that's the way you think and that's the way you talk, let me tell you, that's what's going to come into your life. So Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is the way it ought to be done in our lives. Now, so why then aren't all of God's people living and enjoying his kingdom fully? And why isn't it fully operational in our lives? Well, it's because choices matter in life. And what we choose is what we have. What we choose is what we have. You know, and I can remember as a kid, sometimes we'd go to the store and uh, my mom or dad or grandfather or whatever would give us the opportunity to choose a treat. You know, and we got walk up then and, and this was a store, none, none of you will ever heard of this, but this is a grocery train that used to exist called Food Fair. So we went shopping at Food Fair uh, just about every week. And when it was done, sometimes we could choose something from the candy rack. Now, how many of you know that there are probably at least 100 different kinds of candy that you can choose? So, but the point is, is that when I made a choice, if I didn't like it, then the problem wasn't the candy, the problem was me. Because I made the choice. So choices really do matter in life. And if we want the fullness of God's kingdom in our lives right here in the earth, and it can be, you do not have to wait to heaven to experience the kingdom of God and the blessings of God in your life. You need to experience them now so when you get to heaven, you don't have to go to remedial kingdom school. I mean, we need to know that God has a plan and purpose for us, and his plans are good plans. So we've got to make a choice, whatever we choose in life, it's important. Deuteronomy 30 and 19, he says, This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose what? Life. Choose life, that you and your children may live. We must make a choice for life. And how do we make that choice? We know this well, Proverbs 10 and 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I don't know how it could be more simply put. Directly out of the scripture, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So if you're receiving death or you're receiving life, then it's time to check up and see what's going on with your mouth. Because if there are, if there are problems assailing you from every area, and I can tell you that problems will assail you. But you need to find out if those problems are because the devil is resisting something good that's going on in your life or you're running your mouth negatively. Because if you're running your mouth negatively, then you're going to be in a position that you're going to attract what the devil has planned for you. And as much as God loves you and has great plans for your life and good plans, the devil has a really horrible plan for you and he can't wait for you to participate in it. He can't wait for you to help him out by opening your mouth and talking about how poor you are or how sick you are or how people don't do this for me or that or the other. I mean, the devil just waits for that. That's an opportunity. And so death and life are in the power of the tongue. We choose every day whether we receive life or death, health or sickness, prosperity or poverty. Now, God allows us to choose the life that we live. I mean, he loves us. He doesn't want us to choose death. But if we choose death, that's our choice. He desires for us to live a life of blessing, but he will not stop us from living under the curse. He'll not stop us from living under the curse. Now, we've learned, of course, that we're kings in the earth. Still doing a little bit of review here in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was 
and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Literally, it just means Jesus is king of kings and Lord of lords. And unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings. Everybody say kings. He washed us in his own blood. We just celebrated communion, the blood of Jesus. Through the blood of Jesus, you have been made a king. He's made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Praise God. So, as kings then we have dominion in the earth. Dominion in the earth. Now, I've talked some about dominion before, but uh, literally God gave Adam and Eve dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and everything that creepeth on the earth. So God has given us dominion back through the power of Jesus Christ, through his blood. The, the dominion that was taken from Adam and Eve and was stolen by the devil and has been returned to us by Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 12 and verse 3, fear not, fear not. I, whenever Jesus says that, it must be because people are willing to be afraid. And the spirit of fear will destroy your life. Because fear and faith are two opposite forces. Fear attracts the works of the devil. Faith attracts the works of God. In Luke 12 and verse 31 again, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So this pleases God to give you the kingdom. In other words, you don't have to pay anything for the kingdom. Jesus has already paid the price. He has already defeated the devil. He has already given you the name that is above every name. And when we have everything that we need in Jesus Christ, then we don't need to be afraid of what the devil is going to do or what man is going to do. Because if God be for us, who can be against us? So if we have a kingdom, then we must be a king. If you have a kingdom, you must be a king. If you have a kingdom, you must be a king. Right, I mean, if you have a car, you must be a driver. And that is, as long as you're obeying the laws, I mean, you can have a car and not be a driver, you know that? <laughs> but if you have a car, you must be a driver. Or if you purchase a plane, then you must be a pilot. So I know this, that if you've been given a kingdom, then you are a king. And we need to rule and reign like kings. Kings dominate in the natural. Kings dominate the nations that they rule. Any king, whatever he says, that's the way it goes. And of course, we've been discussing that about how to declare, decree a thing. Decree a thing, and it shall be done unto you. So as kings, we should exercise our dominion. But then we exercise our dominion. So how many of you have been decreeing some things? Okay, praise God. How many of you have received opposition since you started decreeing some things? <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell you, that's exactly what happens. So, so people will see, well, what if I do this king? I know I'm a king, but what if I meet with resistance? What if I meet with resistance? Well, I can tell you something, that you will meet with resistance. Because there will be resistance from the devil and from this world to anything that God is doing in you. If God has given you a vision, if God's been talking to you, and if God is doing things in your life and that becomes obvious to other people, that is a threat to the devil. He will do everything that he can to resist you in achieving what God has for you. Now, if you'll, oh, let's see. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Praise God. Praise God. Many times we put our efforts into a business or a project or a ministry. I mean, other people here that have started businesses. You've been a part of businesses, and you put your efforts into developing that business or a project that's on your heart or a ministry, and it seems that things just don't work out. I mean, I have a vision from God, and he's told me to do so-and-so, but it seems like things just aren't working out. You know, people resist us. 
and circumstances appear to hinder our prosperity. Sometimes we ask if we're even in the right place since nothing seems to be working out. Let me tell you something. If God has given you a calling, don't ever move from that calling until you are absolutely and fully sure that God's calling is moving with you. Because there are plenty of times whenever God will send people to a particular area, they'll experience resistance and they'll move to another area. But the calling stayed where they were, the place that they left. Because callings are specific. God has a specific place that he wants you to be, to, to live. God called us, Marsha and I, to Panama City Beach. Actually, God called me to Panama City Beach back, back in 1985. Now, it was uh, quite a few years later, 13, 14 or so, um, before that began to come into fruition. But the call was there. And since we've come here, we haven't left. We're doing whatever God says to do. So people might resist you. Circumstances might resist you. Sometimes we ask, again, if we're even in the right place. I mean, is this the place we're supposed to be? Since nothing seems to be working out, when we face these times of discouragement, we must look to God for information and solutions. We've got to look to God for information and solutions. Having information is very, very important. Having a solution is very, very important. Now, there are only two sources of information, only two sources of resources for what God has called us to do. One, of course, is the kingdom of this world. And secondly, there is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. So if, if I know that God has given me a vision, he's called me to a place, he's asked me to do something, but I'm getting some resistance, then I need to understand some things about that. I can't look at the circumstances and let the circumstances determine the will of God. Circumstances do not determine the will of God in our lives. I said, circumstances don't determine the will of God in our lives. If they did, we'd all be somewhere else pushing up daisies. Circumstances do not determine the will of God for our lives. So we have this choice about information. Where are we going to get the information we need? Are we going to go to the kingdoms of this world? Are we going to go to the world? Or are we going to go to God? Now, let me tell you something. I'm very grateful. I, I know some folks who are not born again, and they have good information. But you know, it's one thing to have good information. It's another thing to have perfect information. And perfect information can only come from one place, and that is from God. Now, Psalm 1 and 1, I don't have that up there, says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, that's important because if you've received a vision from God, whether it's for your business or your family, uh, whether it's a ministry that God has called you to, if you've received a call from God and there's something you believe you're supposed to accomplish and you need people to help you, let me tell you something, you need godly people. Because if you're going to have counselors around you and, and if you're going to seek information, you don't need to go to people in the world to find out how they would do it. Why is that? Well, it's because they don't have the leadership of the Holy Spirit in their lives. That doesn't mean that they haven't built up some natural wisdom. And it's quite possible to have natural wisdom, but we don't need natural wisdom. When we face circumstances that we don't understand, we need supernatural wisdom from God. We need supernatural counselors in our life. And those are not the people generally that we find out hanging out at the bar Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, and every other night. They're generally not the people who are caught up in the things of this world. We need to hear from God and therefore, we need people in our lives who are godly counselors. Now, in Luke chapter 12 and verse 31, Jesus said this, But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 33, the same rendition in Matthew says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you, everything that you need. But in other words, he didn't say, he didn't say go seek a business degree from Yale. Now, God might have told you to do that personally. If he did, then okay. 
But in most cases, he might be having something else to say with you. Did you know that the way things are working out and with the supernatural application of the Word of God and listening to the Holy Spirit, that God can bring you into a business that is prosperous without you having any, any knowledge about it, without having, you training, without having any training about it beforehand? I mean, God can do that, and He will do that because He's not limited to the way the world does things. We're not limited to how they do things in the world. Now, it's a good thing to have an education, but my brothers and sisters, don't let whatever your educational status is stop you from doing what God has called you to do. As I can tell you, when you get to heaven, God is not going to care about all the diplomas that you, you got here in the earth. Uh, you're not taking them with you. And it's, it's funny, you know, I know I can see a lot of theologians when they see God for the first time, if, they, if they're born again, and they present their credentials. And, and, and they're saying, well, Jesus, let me tell you a few things. And he says, well, I've been trying to talk to you for years, and you haven't been listening. You see, I've got this theology. So it's so important then that we go to God. He said, it's your Father's good pleasure. He says, fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So the answers for questions that you have, the information that you need, the resources that you need are found in God, and He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're kings working with Him. So all the information that we need is going to come from the kingdom of God. Now, you can go to the world and get information, but if you do, you're going to find out that there is some of that information is good and some of it is corrupt. And we need to know... Especially right now, if any of you are invested in the stock market, you need to know. Because I can tell you up there in Wall Street, they don't know. They don't know. But you need to know, what is God saying about this? What is God saying about that? Because as you know, it's important to buy low and sell high. Now, for a lot of people, they have a formula that works differently like that. They buy high and sell low. It doesn't work out for them says, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So God gives us the kingdom, and all the information that we need in order to succeed is in the kingdom of God. It is not in the kingdoms of this world. And if we look for our direction, if we look for information in this world, then we're going to get some information, but it will be corrupt information. It will never take us to where God wants us to be. You see, if I was not born again, I couldn't tell you a thing about going to heaven. I, I couldn't tell you a thing. I, I remember early on that uh, Billy Graham used to tell this story about he was uh, doing a meeting, and this is when he got started. You know, this is when thousands were coming instead of 10,000 and 15,000, 20,000, 100,000 or more. But um, he went down to the post office. Or he was hunting for the post office and walked all over town. And finally he saw this little boy over there. And he walked up to the young man and said, Hi, young man, how you doing? He said, oh, I'm doing okay. He said, Well, can you tell me where the post office is? And, and so the little boy says, Sure. Well, you take this street and that street and say, turn right. You're going to be right there at the post office. He said, Thank you. And by the way, let me invite you to a special meeting that we're having tonight. I'm telling people how to get to heaven. The little boy looked at him and said, well, how are you going to tell me how to get to heaven when you don't even know where the post office is? <laughs> Information. Information is very, very important. In Jeremiah 33 and 3, call unto me. Pick up the phone. What is that old song in the gospel song, Jesus on the line or whatever? In the main line. <laughs> pick up the phone and connect with God because he has the information that you need. If you're willing to spend enough time in prayer and in the word of God, you will have the information that you need for whatever situation that you're in. You will have the information that you need to fix any problem in your house, in your business, wherever you go. Oh, glory. Call unto me and I will answer thee. When you call God, you never get a busy signal. 
Now, we send busy signals to God all the time. God wants to talk to us. And we say, God, can you talk to me? I'm, I'm busy. I'm busy. But God wants to say things to us. He says, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God has the information that we need. God has the resources that we need. He has the connections that we need. He has all those things prepared for us. Now, the most precious commodity in the Middle East is and always has been water. And you'll find throughout history that wars have been fought to control water resources. And whoever controls water is wealthy and powerful. Whoever, whoever can control the water in their country, that person is a wealthy and powerful person. So when Abraham's son, Isaac, was ready to expand his business operation, he was short on resources. And so he needed more. And what did he need? He required more water. Because if you're going to have larger flocks and larger herds, then you need more water. And you need water that's going to be close enough for those herds to get to so they can be watered. You don't want them to have to walk 30 or 40 miles every day to get water. So he needed some resources. And in order for us to accomplish our calling, we also have to have resources. And God is never going to ask you to do something that you can take care of in the resources you already have. I mean, so if you're expecting God to ask you to do something that you can do on your own, then you are wasting your time. But on the other hand, when God is asking you to do something, He is always going to ask you to do something that requires resources that you don't have. But you see, he doesn't ask us to pay for things. He asks us to believe for things. So if we believe, if we operate by faith, then we will have all the resources that we need. In order to complete our calling, we need more resources. I need more resources than I have today to complete what God has called me to do. And I think that's absolutely true for everybody who is listening to God and believing God. Because God never calls you to do the, do the possible. He only calls us to do the impossible. In Genesis chapter 26 and verse 19, it says, Isaac's servants, being a good businessman, he sent out an advanced team to check and see where water might be available. It says, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, The water is ours, because it's a precious resource. This water belongs to us. So he named that well Asek because they disputed with him. Now, the word uh, Asek in Hebrew means contention. Contention is hinders our success. Contention hinders our success. H have you ever been in a situation where uh, you've been at work, maybe you've owned your own business, or maybe you just manage people? And have you know that if people are constantly fighting amongst themselves, that they're not going to be productive? You know, and, and there's some others that just get into contention. You know, I remember being in the sales force, been, uh, sales force, been a salesperson all of my life. And I discovered early on that the people who weren't successful were the people who met every morning at the coffee shop for coffee to talk about why, why the business wasn't working. They met, met every day to say, well, we can't do this. I mean, if the boss would only let us do this, or if the boss would only let us do that, we'd succeed. Well, my brothers and sisters, I want you to know that you will succeed no matter what the boss does if you put your faith in God. And you put your trust in God. So here he dug this well, expended this, and, and, and the neighbors didn't like it. And they were contention. And contention hinders our success in Proverbs 13 and 10. He says, only by pride cometh contention. Only by pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. What is the wisdom? Don't get involved in contention. Don't get involved in quarreling and strife. Now, in Proverbs 17 and 14, it says, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. How many of you know that just a little tiny hole in a dam will eventually cause the whole thing to crash? Because water is very powerful. 
the King James in this verse reads, leave off contention. Quit being contentious. Now, here's the question. Did Isaac and his servants have a right to be contentious? I mean, after all, they had done all the work. They had dug this well, and these other people say, no, this is ours. And he had a right, I guess, to be contentious. Did you know everybody has a right to be rude? Did you know that? Have you ever met any people like that who exercise that right frequently? <laughs> so all of us have rights. The question is, what are we going to do with them? Sometimes we need to lay down rights for the success that is ahead of us. In Proverbs, oh, let me, let me see this. Isaac refused defeat. Now, he refused to allow defeat in his pursuit, his pursuit of the resources that he needed. And, and I want you to understand this. He went to a well. It didn't work out. He paid all this money, and all he got was contention. And it didn't work out. And he could have decided to quit. He could have said, well, God, you know, you gave me this vision for the expansion of my business, and I needed more resources, and I, I went, and I did what I was supposed to do, and the resources were mine. These people are yelling at me. They're screaming at me. It's getting dangerous. <laughs> I think I'm just going to quit. And I can tell you that there are going to be people who will get in your face about how you cannot do what God has called you to do. There are going to be people who will get in your face and tell you you don't know what you are doing in business. You don't have a clue. You don't have an idea. There are going to be people who get in your face and say it's obvious that because you have all these problems, you don't have a clue as to what's going on in your family. You know, and there are going to be people out there who are going to contend with you. And so when these people in Gerar began to contend with Isaac's servants, Isaac had a choice. He could either complain about their interference or he could move forward. So what did he do? Well, he decided to dig another well. He decided to go dig another well. Okay, well, if these people are not happy over here. Uh, yeah, it's my time and my resources, but I'm just going to go. I'm going to dig another well. So in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 21, it says, Then they dug another well. But they quarreled over that one also. How many of you know there's equal opportunity quarrelers out there? I mean, some people will follow you around just to fight you. Have, have, you, have you noticed that? I mean, they will follow you around. They will call you on the phone. They'll show up at your house. They'll show up at your business to tell you how bad you're messing things up and how it's all your fault. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also, so he named that one Sitna in the Hebrew, which means opposition. But my brothers and sisters, the opposition that was being encountered here by Isaac in expanding his business was not op opposition from God. These were the ungodly that were resisting him. And yet there are a lot of Christians, whenever they get resistance from the world, they think, well... You know, maybe it isn't God's will for me to do this because everybody's against it. And it's not, and most of the time, it's not that everybody is against it. It's a few vocal people who are against it. But God is not the one working in these circumstances. If God has called you, then why would he do something to hinder you from accomplishing his plan? Because in his plan is not only your prosperity, but the blessing that will flow through your life and from your life to bring other people into the kingdom of God. It makes no sense that God would be resisting you. So we know this is the work of the devil operating through people. You've got to do some things that are very, very important. Now look with me at Matthew chapter 10 and verse 14. And I'll tell you this, some people and places will oppose the things that God has called you to do. Now, I'm not saying by that 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 means you're supposed to leave that place. As a matter of fact, in my life, it seems like that the more resistance I get, the more confident I become that it's God. <laughs> the more resistance you get over something that God has called you to do should not cause you to be dissuaded in doing what God has called you to do. You know, I, I, am, I am perfectly happy if my picture is up on the post office in hell saying wanted. Because I can tell you 
that the devil is not going to stop me and no human being is going to stop me from accomplishing what God has called me to do. And it ought to be the same way with you, my brothers and sisters. Why would you let any mealy mouth, no count devil and those people that he uses get in your face and stop you from achieving the plan and the calling of God in your life? I mean, that's not the way it's supposed to be. But when they come up, look at Matthew 10 and verse 14. Jesus said this. He'd sent out the disciples to lay a little word on some folks. He says, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your word, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. You know what that means? It's time to shake it off. <laughs> time to shake it off. Because you're going to go places, you're going to encounter people that they won't receive you or you'll find those are motiv motivated not to receive you or they plan to receive you. They act like they receive you, but what really uh, the thing that they're doing is they're trying to deceive you. And you have to shake, you've got to shake those things off. You've got to shake it off and keep playing. If, if, you're, if you're injured in sports, and hopefully that you have somebody there that is advising you, but just because you get injured doesn't mean you can't have a future. Just because you, just because you uh, have a sprained ankle does not mean that in the future you cannot carry the ball. And it's just the way it is. But some people allow these setbacks that come from other people and things that people say to get a hold of them. They let it get on the inside of them and they quit. Well, I, God, I guess that just wasn't your will. I mean, I... I, I, I lost my employees. I, I, I lost my business. Uh, uh, you know, people don't like me. Um, I've heard people say, you know, I just can't get a break in this town. Well, let me tell you, the town will never give you a break. If you want a break, you've got to make it with the Word of God. I mean, you can, you can never get a break from a town or a place or people. There is no justice in this town. There is no justice in this earth. If you're looking for real justice, it only comes from heaven. So you've got to shake it off. Now in Genesis chapter 26 and 22, the first well, they contended. The second will, well, they were opposed. You can't do this. You can't do this. There's no way. So Isaac had a choice. I mean, he could have quit. Well, Lord, I guess that wasn't your vision for me and my business and my family. I guess that wasn't what you called me to do. But look at verse 26, uh, 22 of chapter 26 here. He says, he moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, saying, now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. We will flourish in the land. Now, if we are in the land that God has called us to as believers, we will flourish. We will excel. We will accomplish what God has called us to do, but we are the ones that have to get busy doing what God has called us to do. Because it's one thing to ask God about what He wants us to do and to hear what He wants us to do, but there's something else that is required. It's that we've actually got to do what God wants us to do. And unless we do what God wants us to do, then we can't have success. But here's the, here's the note here. If you've received contention, you've received opposition, these things always come through people, always come through people, then it is time to move on and dig another well. And some of us perhaps need to evaluate the relationships that we have in our lives. Because there, there are people who may be in their own minds well-meaning, but they're speaking evil, things contrary to the Word of God. And if you allow yourself to be surrounded by people who are negative, negative, negative all the time, you are not going to become positive. I mean, if, if you're going to listen to people tell you how you can't make it, you know, if you're going to listen to people tell you that, you know, it might be God's will for you to be suffering in your business. It might be God's will for your children to be sick with cancer. Oh, I tell you, somebody said that the other day. It makes my skin crawl. I, I just... When I, when, when, I, when I hear things like that and I see things like that written about how God will allow the devil to come in and put cancer on some child, I, I tell you, it just that it's absolutely cringeworthy. 
And, and yet, the odd thing is, is that those people would be the first people to call defects on their next door neighbor if they thought that child was being abused. I don't know if you understand what I'm just saying there, but people think that God is a child abuser. And they'll blame God for all these kinds of things and say that he's a child abuser, he makes people sick, he steals their finances. And yet, if they believe a child is being abused in their neighborhood, they'll be on the phone to the state just like that and tell them, you need to check this out because this child is being abused. I will tell you something. God is not an abuser. He cares about you. He loves you, and he loves your family, and it is not his will by any shape or form or fashion to make people sick and give them cancer and steal from them. That is not how God operates. But yet there are many people who think that. But there are times we need to move on. We need to move on from some folks and dig another well. No more contention. No more opposition. So we could say that Isaac drilled three wells. The first one, he got contention. The second one, he got opposition. And the third one, he moved into the blessing. He moved into the blessing. So he wasn't dissuaded by the fact that the first two wells didn't work out. And I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a place where the first two jobs, or the first three jobs, or whatever, it, it didn't work out. That doesn't change the plan and purpose of God for you. Rehoboth, as is said here, means a wide place. More than enough room, more than enough water to expand my business. No more contention and no more opposition. Paul had this same attitude and he dug another well. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 36, it says, After some days, some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to carry or to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention, so a contention began to arise uh, between Paul and Barnabas. And the contention was over a person. It wasn't contention over a demon it was contention over a person. Paul said, this is what I want for my ministry team. I, I don't think he's qualified because he abandoned us before. And Barnabas being a good guy, well, I want him with me. But it says this, the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another, or one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul took Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So Paul and Silas got the blessing of the brethren for the mission that God had called Paul to do. But now Paul could have decided, you know, okay, well, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Barnabas wants me to take Mark, but I don't think that's God. Well, I'll just do it anyway. Now, what do you think would have happened? Eventually, there would have been more strife kindled. And that strife would have short-circuited the operation of the power of God in Paul and Silas' ministry. Now, by the way, Barnabas is, is an excellent man. You know John Mark. You can read his book. But I'll tell you this. We have to be watchful in every aspect regarding people in our lives and make sure that we are taking with us the people that God has called us to take with us. And we have people in our lives and ministries, the ones that God has called to be there. Paul moved on, dug another well, and had great success in ministry. And my brothers and sisters, we need to move on and dig some new wells. 
We need to move on from some situations, relationships, businesses, whatever they may be, and dig another well because God's plan for us does not change no matter what other people do. God will never hold you responsible for someone else's failure. God will never hold you responsible for what other people do. But he does hold us responsible for what we do. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and let's look here at verse 24 and following. It says, And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Okay, so it's obviously that there are a bunch of people who are, weren't the Lord's servants at Isaac's first well. Or the second well, because they were quarreling. The Lord's servant must not quarrel. Did you know that it takes two to have an argument? You know, and I've known people, told, you know, I... Can tell you that said things to me like you'd argue with a fence post and stuff like that, which isn't entirely true. But anyway, I would stack up three or four fence posts and argue with them. But anyway, it says he must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone. Suppose Isaac had decided, well, we're just going to go to war over this well. You know, a lot of people would have been hurt. A lot of people died. And would there be a witness for? The love of God? Absolutely not. It says, instead, we must be kind to everyone, apt to teach, not resentful. Now, Timothy was a young minister, and Paul was writing to him and said, hey, you can't carry resentment around over what people have done. And it's not a matter either of it just being ministry. It's in everything. We can't be resentful over what people have done. Most people don't know what they've done because they're not thinking about anyone but themselves. It says, don't be resentful. Those who oppose him, so there had to be some response to the opposition. He says, those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. So if we're in opposition, we want to treat people with kindness and with the love of God. Now, I mean, that doesn't mean that the whole time that you're dealing with them, treating them with kindness and love of God, that you're not feeling in your head and hearing how it would be a good idea to pinch their heads off and tell God they died. I mean, but no, we've got to be kind according to the Word of God. Because we want them to come to the knowledge of the truth. I mean, I, I can tell you I've had a few people stab me in the back. And you probably have too. But I still am most interested in finding out what their relationship with God is and helping them get to heaven. Because that's the attitude of God. And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive. So... What takes people captive? By the devil, quarreling, strife. The servant of the Lord must not strive. They've been taken captive by the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Now, sometimes we need to be willing to examine our lives to find out if we're walking in strife. So if we're walking in strife with people, that's going to hinder the flow of the knowledge that we need. We need information. We need resources. But strife cuts all that off. And we become captive to do what the devil wants. So we can't be fighting at home. We can't be fighting at work. Can't be fighting with our friends. What we need to do is walk in love. Because if we don't, then we're taken captive by the devil to do his will. How many of you want to be used by the devil? I don't see any takers. So if we don't want to be used by the devil, then we must not strive. We must not quarrel. It's dangerous. I don't want to be taken captive by the devil to do his will but I do want to be fully controlled by God and His Spirit as I yield myself to Him so that I can accomplish the will of my Father. Luke chapter 12 and verse 31 will wrap things up. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, we've been saying, we've been decreeing. All kinds of circumstances we face, 
But once again, let me remind you. But rather, seek ye first, or seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things. Seek ye the kingdom of God. The entrance to the kingdom of God is through a personal relationship with Jesus. There's no other way in. But seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. God, if you're, if you're seeking the kingdom of God, you're going to him and to godly counselors, and you're going to have all the information and all the resources that you need to succeed at home, to succeed in your business, to succeed in ministry, to do anything that God has called you to do. He says, all these things shall be added unto you. And then he says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Say, I have the kingdom. Look at your neighbor and say, you have the kingdom. Praise God. We are kings and we're to rule and reign in this earth. Praise God. Let's pray.